Hi. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Daniel Ignacio. I am uh, from Huntington's Disease Society of America. I'm from the Orange County chapter, uh, and I also work for St. Jude's Brain Injury Network. Um, so today, uh, what we're going to be talking about is living with Huntington's disease. So a reintroduction into um, some best practices and maybe um, even introducing some things that you don't know about, but things that, or maybe some things that you've heard about and so um, strategies that you can implement into your lives today to sort of su uh, supplement uh, the things that you're doing to make things easier for you and your loved one. So um, my disclosures, I am from the uh, HDSA Orange County chapter. I work for St. Jude's Brain Injury Network in Fullerton, and I also teach, uh, I'm a professor at um, Cal State Fullerton, Cal State University Fullerton. So um, those are my uh, disclosures. I have no financial disclosures, so anything that we're going to be talking about, uh, any sorts of products or bases or anything like that, um, I am not affiliated in any way, shape, or form. These are just um, strategies, products that have been helpful for us and our survivors of brain injury at St. Jude's. And so uh, no other financial disclosures to uh, admit to. So uh, a little bit for our time together. So uh, I'm just going to be laying out uh, some context for what we're going to be talking about. So the understanding and the treatment of Huntington's disease has been changing drastically, right? And so the question of whether or not uh, a cure exists has shifted. And so now it's, may, it's sort of being onto a part of when this sort of um, treatment will be available. And so uh, at this point, we, we just need to maintain and hold out up until that point where uh, treatment is commercially available. And so, uh, like, like you all know, there is a huge heterogeneity in the onset of Huntington's disease, the progression and the rate of progression of Huntington's disease, and even within the progression and the rate and onset of Huntington's disease, even large heterogeneity in the amount or the kind of symptoms that are experienced. So for example, uh, someone could have uh, two people, exact same HD diagnosis, but one can have um, the, the uh, deteriorating physical difficulties that are associated with HD, but have all of their cognitive faculties are acute and they're sharp. And then we can also have the complete opposite side where um, there are no physical uh, difficulties or abnormalities, yet cognitively um, they're they are progressing at a degenerative rate that is very concerning. And so they're forgetting things from moment to moment to moment. Um, so uh, there are uh, assistive technologies and strategies to cover all sorts of um, those ends of the spectrum and everywhere in between. So that's kind of a lot and uh, we're going to be trying to cover um, that wide spectrum uh, in this hour. So, uh, like we were talking about earlier, the, the workshop will introduce first the standard best practices, like what is used uh, right now and what are sort of the um, standards of care that are recommended most usually. And so these are talking about things like cognitive restructuring, cognitive rehabilitation. There's also physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. And even uh, in COG and speech therapy, we might even be talking about some strategies that you or a loved one may want to at least try or implement into your lives like today. Um, so uh, the broad topics that we'll be discussing in the same sort of order are uh, first, we'll be talking a little bit about some research, right? Uh, so um, just to lay some context of what we're talking about. Then we're gonna be talking about some assistive technologies and uh, that's integrating technology into our everydays here. Um, and so we'll, next we'll, we'll do a tour of durable medical equipment or DMEs. And so here are what um, the assistive technologies that could be covered by um, you know, Medicare, Medicaid, other private insurances under what they would call durable medical equipment or 
DMEs. Then uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some compensatory physical techniques uh, and in the way that we could use assistive technology to um, help with a home exercise regimen, right? And here uh, there are two, um, uh, two handouts that we have for, to supplement this particular talk, both of which are available online at tbioc.com or .org slash brain dash education. So again, that's tbioc.org slash brain dash education. Um, and also uh, here on the website at HDSA, uh, we'll probably have that as well. And so these are the different home exercises that are available. And uh, lastly, we'll talk about uh, hacks for daily living and how we can use these hacks to simplify life so that it can be as organized and as simple and as easy as possible to accommodate for our cognitive changes. And in this way, we can maintain positivity and remain optimistic until um, a uh, cure can become commercially available. Um, so uh, first, we'll lay the context, a little bit of research, Right, and you might have been hearing through here and a bunch of other different um, organizations uh, and talks. So uh, I'm by no means a, uh, an expert on this. I am just uh, um, recovering over some uh, research that is available out of the Ionis and Roche lab, or in the United States is known as Genentech. Uh, so here they, they have uh, developed HTTRX, which is a Huntington lowering uh, drug. Right, um, it, it is a, right now it's in its initial stages. It's just completed the first stage. Uh, it's one half A. And so here in this one, it's, a, uh, it's been shown to be safe and well tolerated. So those were the two goals, the primary goals of phase one half A for HGTRX. Um, it's not to be showing efficacy or anything like that or effectiveness. It's initially showing safety, which it has. It's been shown to have safety and so be well tolerated. And so now it has been gone into um, path C or C path of the FDA to be accelerated onto phase three, where now it is currently being planned the stages for phase three to show exactly what, the, what stage one half A was not, didn't quite uh, get to, was efficacy. So that is, we'll be having those, we'll be getting updates soon on that. And so uh, the drug did reach its genetic target, but there were less than 50 participants, 46 to be exact. Um, so, which is too small to be sure, but it's promising. So uh, like we've been talking about all throughout this weekend, when will this uh, phase three drug be available? It's difficult to say because like all things in life, it depends. But there are lots of steps to take. And so like we're saying, um, now that it's been shown efficacy and because there are so few drugs available to cure or treat Huntington's disease, it has gone through uh, an accelerated path or C path which is HDRSC. Um, and so uh, some prelim preliminary benefits of HDTRX are that um, there is a correlation, there is a, there is a statistical significantly correlation between um, the lowering of Huntington, this mutant Huntington protein, and increases in um, cognitive um, outcomes, uh, overall symptomatic uh, outcomes of HD. And so those have been shown to be effective. So with lowering Huntington proteins, we have an increase in motor functions, cognitive functions, decreases in behavioral abnormalities, and overall increase in functional capacity. And so uh, the benefits have been shown to start showing after three months, although the uh, Ionis and Roche lab have projected maximum benefits to be at six months. Um, so the next stages are to show efficacy, which will be planned in phase three, which will be coming hopefully very soon to a center of excellence near you. Um, 
So until then, the reason why we're sharing this sort of research is to lay the context. It, there's a lot of things to be optimistic for, and we just want to lay this research so that we can share an optimism in which this entire presentation is based on. So Curious is on its way. Now we just need to hold off or maintain until that point. So what are the best practices that we can use today that can maintain our optimism for tomorrow. Um, and so uh, here are some assistive technologies that, uh, we, that uh, some caregivers have found to be um, helpful. So here like shower knobs, automatic door closers, gas stove, um, automatic shutoffs that are on timers, uh, single remote controls, or even it can be as simple as um, you know, a sign right outside your front door that tells you the things that you need before you leave the house. So wallet, cell phone, keys. And so all of those things can be considered assistive technology. So technology, when we say a tech, right, it doesn't mean that it has to be very technologically advanced. It could be something as easy as a post-it that you put on your front door. So when we say assistive technology or a tech, right, what exactly are we saying? So a tech defined by uh, the um, Individuals with Disabilities Act in 1998 has been described as equipment, a product system or some sort of program that you purchase off of the shelf, you modify it, or you customize it so that it's personally uh, personalized to you. Uh, it's either one of these three things that you purchase or you make or you create or you customize, you personalize. So to increase, maintain or improve the function or quality of life for individuals with disabilities, All right? And so there's a lot of different assistive technologies out there. Um, like starting from low end, low tech, for like post-its to high tech to high, very expensive pieces of equipment and everywhere in between. So there are tons and tons of assistive technologies out there. And so the goal of a tech is to pick uh, one, all of all those different technologies that are available to pick, hand pick, select one or two or three or four or a handful of these ATEX that are available and select them personally for the individualized needs of you or your loved one so that um, it is, can optimize your quality of life as much as possible. And so uh, the ATEX that we'll be talking about, so there's a lot out there. Um, and so the, the primary categories that we'll be talking about today, um, either ones that fit into computer accessibility. And so these are uh, devices or applications or structures that, can, um, that you can use to access your computer, right? And why would that be very helpful? Well, um, when you can access your computer, um, that allows you to a whole set of supports that are out there, either for you can co communicate with your loved ones in real time, or you can communicate with outside resources, right? Or you can even uh, use it to uh, access the internet. That way you can really see what information is available there for you. Um, and now, so, and then the second way is through communication. Right? And so we can use assistive technology to assist in communicating to your loved ones or to some outside internet uh, support. And so um, to access the ATEX that are available to access your computer are first there are dictation programs. And so, um, and for, for this assistive technology tour that we'll be taking, uh, because, uh, you know, not everyone has um, what good funding sources or anything like that. Uh, we'll try as much to cover, of course, cover the range of spectrum there. So we'll be, hopefully be trying to cover um, a tech that is free or a tech that is low to minimal cost. 
And then, of course, we'll um, be covering a tech that is expensive. Or, at the very least, even if it is expensive, um, it can be covered under Medicare or other similar insurance providers as durable medical equipment. So first off, we'll be talking about dictation programs, uh, which are free, and essentially they can help you access your computers, your machines, and so either you have a Mac or you have a Windows, right? Um, I am Daniel and I'm a Windows, and so sometimes there are some Macintosh people out there, and so in which case, for Macintosh, um, it's called the, the uh, uh, collection of uh, accessibility tools is referred to as accessibility options, whereas on Windows, all those accessibility tools are referred to as the Ease of Access Center. And I'll be showing some videos on how to best access each one of those. Um, so here are the accessibility tools that are on available for a Mac. So what I'm going to do to open up the menu of what accessibility features we have is we're going to go over to the top left here and click on this Apple. Then System Preferences. And now we can see a whole bunch of options for our computer. What we're looking for here is accessibility. So right away, it's opened up a menu on the side with a list of different features. Some for vision, media, hearing, and interacting. What I can also do is go ahead and click this button here and actually show the accessibility status in the menu bar. So my menu bar up here gives me all kinds of information about the computer. And if I click on that, I can now see that this accessibility menu has been added and I can get to a lot of these features and turn them on and off right here. Yeah, and so um, for the accessibility options, uh, there are some different ones for vision. And so for some people, uh, if, if vision is an issue, it can invert the colors to enhance borders so you can detect borders more easily with inverted colors. Or, um, you know, it can, uh, you can um, have Mac read to you, uh, read what's on the text and uh, be able to uh, have them read back to you what it says on, the, uh, on your screen. Or you can even have, uh, so Mac can read to you or it can listen. You can talk to it and it can listen. And so here we'll see what that looks like under Mac Dictation. Using Dictation on a Mac is really easy. The first thing you want to do is go up to System Preferences and go down to Dictation and Speech and then turn Dictation on. Choose the language that you would like to use and then choose the shortcut keys that you would like to use to turn Dictation on. In this case, I use either command key by pressing it twice because I find that that's the easiest for me. Once you have that turned on, all you need to do is go to any application that you'd like to use it in, whether it be Notes or Pages or Word or Facebook or anything, and put your cursor where you would like to start typing and press your command key twice. And then it just starts recording your voice and turning it into text, period. Now, sometimes I don't speak very clearly, so it has some trouble at times, comma, but it gets it mostly right, period. And so for here, uh, this is a, an ability. So if, let's say, um, the keyboard gets cumbersome or there, there's a lack of uh, being able to type into a keyboard, right? there are additional accessibility options to get you to talk and your computer will listen to you. And so as, as we also talk about, I just want to highlight that all these accessibility features, you don't have to download them or anything like that. They are already preloaded into your machines, right? And so um, for Windows, that was in Macintosh, but also for Windows, um, those are the same features that are available in Windows, but you access them using um, the Ease of Access Center, which is found through here, and we'll see what that looks like. Instead of using the physical keyboard to type and enter data, you can use the on-screen keyboard. To begin, click the Start button, click All Programs, click Accessories, click Ease of Access, and then click On-Screen Keyboard. 
You can enter text by clicking the keys. You can also set it to enter text by hovering over the keys or by scanning through them. Right, and so here in the ease of a uh, ease of access center, which is uh, o the Windows equivalent for the accessibility options in Mac, uh, we can also not only can it read to you, but it will listen to you. But it can also change the colors to increase the visibility of your desktop, and also you can have an on-screen keyboard, which. Um, eliminates the use of having to, let's say, have the fine motor dexterity to having to type into a keyboard, for example. And so there are a bunch of different uh, options, and, uh, um, but the options and differing um, levels of the degrees of which you would apply those options will depend on um, what your needs are and what your loved one's needs are. Um, so next, uh, we have also to follow along with that is Prismo. So if let's say in the situation that you and your loved one are in a, let's say a doctor's office and uh, they would like to read and they're at a point where um, being able to read on their own is difficult and so they need um, the uh, items read to them. And so in that case, you can use uh, Prismo, which we'll talk about here, to uh, turn a, let's say, photograph that, um, let's say, uh, you're at a doctor's office and you're reading a magazine and your loved one wants to read it too, but, um, you know, you have um, no way of being able to read it to them. What you can do is take a picture of a magazine and a Prismo will um, correct for any page curvature and then turn whatever you took a picture of into text, then you can use an accessibility option on let's say your iPhone so that it can then read the text to your loved one so your loved one can enjoy uh, whatever it is that you're reading on a magazine at the same time that you do. Prismo is the easy-to-use scanning tool that'll make scanning your documents and correcting your pictures easier than ever. Prismo uses highly accurate optical character recognition technology to quickly and accurately scan your documents and natively works in 10 languages, including English, French, German, Dutch, and Italian. Don't have a scanner? No problem. Prismo can scan your documents by dropping in pictures you have already taken or plugging in your iPhone and simply taking a picture. In addition to the iPhone, Prismo works with Nikon and Canon DSLR cameras as well. Prismo's built-in image processing technology does basic image processing like rotation and color correction, but it can also correct lens distortion, page curvature, and perspective to make scanning texts or correcting your pictures accurate and easy. Prismo is great for using your home scanner to scan common documents like invoices and receipts. But Prismo stands out from other apps by turning your iPhone and DSLR camera into the scanner you always have with you. And so um, th that is an option that you can have if uh, uh, you want to scan something in real time and have your iPhone or your um, uh, your uh, iPhone or iMac to uh, read to your loved one in real time so they can enjoy the same things that you are experiencing at the same time that you do. Um, and so uh, those are all options like we're talking about that are available. Accessibility options under Mac or Ease of Access Center under Windows. And so these are all different options that are currently available on your respective machines already, right? And so though these are all free, granted that you have a Mac or Windows. Um, and so, uh, and in, in conjunction, but uh, so if we want to go to the other end of the higher end of the spectrum, right? So these are the higher techs, uh, the higher tech speech generating devices. And so uh, these are also called eye tracking devices, which can be very helpful for very um, high progressed stages of HD, where an individual may not be able to speak or be able to move safely and freely and independently. So um, eye tracking devices have been uh, created and are available that can be um, 
paid for or uh, assisted through by your Medicare or other insurance carriers. And so um, eye tracking uses pupil and corneal reflection. So based off of the glares that uh, that come off of your your cornea or the inside of your um, or the outside of your pupil, based off of that reflection, um, it will take based off uh, using mathematical uh, equations and algorithms, it'll be able to take the corneal reflections from your eyes and use that to predict where you are looking onto the screen and it will move the um, cursor of a com computer mouse cursor accurately onto the desktop so that uh, the things that you're looking at, it can be picked up accurately and in real time. And so the first one, this one is still free. Um, this is a, a, a program that was developed out of Boston University and it's called Camera Mouse. And so Camera Mouse uses the webcam on your um, present device and uses that as a way to track your eyes so that it can move the computer cursor. Camera Mouse is a program developed at Boston College that allows you to control the mouse pointer on a Windows computer just by moving your head. Camera Mouse is available for free download at cameramouse.org. Let's demonstrate the use of Camera Mouse. When you start up Camera Mouse, a live feed of the video from your webcam appears in the Camera Mouse window. Select a feature for Camera Mouse to track. Here we are selecting the corner of the left eye. As you move your head up, down, right, left, the mouse pointer follows. You can tell whether the mouse or Camera Mouse is in control by looking in the Camera Mouse window right below the video. Let's open the Camera Mouse Settings window. First, we turn on clicking. Clicking in Camera Mouse is done using dwell time. Hold the mouse pointer over a small area on the screen for a second, and a left click is issued. Next. And um, also, so as, as he was talking about there, it uses the webcam, and so uh, clicking is, uh, is initiated by what they call dwell time. So if a, you or your loved one looks at one place on the screen for more than two or three seconds, it will automatically click. Um, but let's say uh, your loved one is having difficulties with, let's say, head movements, the chorea, right, and the head jerkingness. And so possibly how, how, could, uh, how could something like camera mouse be helpful for someone with um, uh, uncontrolled head movements. And so they've built into that, what they've built in to control for uncontrolled head movements is um, options called smoothing. And so what smoothing does is it takes the average of where you're looking, the head movements, and it will average all of those so that instead of if you're going to look up in one direction, it'll average all of your head movements so that it gives you a nice, smooth, directional one a psychotic movement of where the um, computer mouse will be going. And so that's one way to uh, access your computer hands-free. Another way to access hands-free is uh, using, let's say, if you've lost uh, the upper extremities, you've lost control of your upper extremities. There are some individuals who still have control of their lower extremities. And so if they have control of their lower extremities, this is a foot mouse, which what, uh, what, you've, uh, which what will be done here is using your feet to um, access and to move the mouse, much like you would uh, with your hands, only you, it's done with your lower extremities. So that's another way to access uh, your uh, computer hands-free, um, through the humansolutions.com slash footmouse.html. Other ways that you can access your computer hands-free are things like the hands-free touchpads, which can be seen at handsfreetouchpad.com. And so here are low to minimal cost ways for you to access your computer hands-free. The Ergonomic Touchpad's Hands-Free Touchpad is a fast and simple way to control your mouse without the use of your arms or hands. Just lightly graze the surface and the cursor responds to your every move. 
It works on all computers, and you'll be amazed at just how easy it is to use. Control the cursor by lightly dragging your chin across the surface of the touchpad. And so here, uh, you're able to use um, uh, chin movements, head movements to control mouse movements on, so that you wouldn't actually have to use your hands uh, to move the cursor. Um, other ways, if let's say you're having uh, difficulties with um, having to touch or use um, a mouse or any external ways to control a keyboard uh, or a mouse that could be difficult. Or even if let's say you're a caregiver, right, and you're trying to access your computer, but let's say you're juggling four, five, 10, 15, 50 different things at once as a caregiver, right? And so um, w would it be easier to, let's say, if you could access your computer by simply touching the things that you needed on your desktop, right? And so uh, we can essentially turn any screen, any computer into a touch screen with the air bar. This is Airbar. Airbar brings touch to your newer existing PC by projecting an invisible light field over the screen. And what's good about light is that it responds to pretty much anything. So you can swipe with your gloves or long fingernails, pinch with your chopsticks, scroll while you're cooking, or why not use a paintbrush? You get the idea. With Airbar, you get touch gestures when you need them. It's easy to attach, it's sleek, it won't drain your battery, and you can unplug it when you want to. Best of all, there's no manual, no installation. It's plug and touch. It just works. Airbar, plug and touch when you need it. Right, so Airbar. And so here's another way that you can, um, depending on your individualized needs, um, maybe a foot mouse or a chin controlled uh, mouse pad or even just the traditional mouse don't work for you, right? So maybe a touch screen might be easier. Right, based on your individual needs of you or your loved one. Um, and uh, there are tons of other different applications that are low cost or free. Um, uh, that um, there, There's so many, in fact, that there's no way that we could possibly cover them in one afternoon. Um, but if you're interested in continuing to look through the available devices, the available um, technologies that are out there, um, you can visit or access um, this list at tbioc.org slash brain dash education. Um, and so now uh, we've talked about the accessibility options, the ease of access center, free uh, applications that you can download or that are already preloaded onto your machines, low to minimal costs, right, different strategies. So now what we're going to be talking about are the higher ends of the ATEC. Right? These are the expensive, the expensive ones, the ones that uh, you want your Medicaid, your Medicare to cover, right? Because this is anywhere upwards of eight to nine to 10,000, maybe even more, right? And so these higher tech devices are referred to as speech generating devices or SGDs. And uh, of course, like we're, co we're discussing earlier, um, these sorts of devices may be, may be covered by Medicare or other insurance providers under what is called durable medical equipment or DME. And so um, some examples uh, of uh, different SGDs um, or the DMEs that are that we're talking about here are the Toby, the Toby Eye series. That's including the Toby Dynavox, um, the Eye Gaze Edge Talker, and the Eye Tribe Tracker. Right, and so these are where um, the different websites for each one of those. And so uh, the these slides are available on the website, and so you can track these individual uh, speech generating devices. Should you be interested in? you know, looking at the different options of what's available. Um, and so for, let's say here, the, the first one, Toby Eye Series, um, a little bit about what those are is it's an eye tracking device that also generates speech. Eye tracking is a technology that is used to see where a person is looking on a computer screen. The technology can also be used to control a computer. Instead of using a traditional keyboard and mouse, you control it by using your eyes. Illuminators in the eye tracker send out near-infrared light that is reflected by your eyes. 
A camera registers these reflections and through filtering and advanced calculations, we can determine where on the screen you are looking and then place the computer cursor consistently and accurately. There are certain things that set Toby Dynavox eye trackers apart from others. Besides an unprecedented pattern portfolio and many technical details, one is the fact that we use a unique and very accurate 3D model of a human eye. With this model, you don't need to keep your head still when using a Toby eye tracker. In fact, you can move your head freely without any significant loss of precision or accuracy. This is particularly beneficial for individuals with uncontrolled head movement, such as those with cerebral palsy. For accurate eye tracking, the eye tracker needs to find your pupils. This can be done through either bright or dark pupil tracking. Bright pupil tracking works similarly to when you get red eyes using a compact camera with a flash. By placing the flash, or in this case the illuminators, farther away from the lens, you can avoid this. This is dark pupil tracking. Toby Dynavox eye trackers are unique in that they dynamically switch between bright and dark pupil tracking, so you'll always have an optimized eye tracking experience. There are many other things that make Toby Dynavox eye trackers unique. To learn more, please visit tobydynavox.com. The other one that we're talking about is the Medicare compliant eye gaze edge talker. Right, and so if you're having difficulties with any of your Medicare needs, right, and so um, each one of these, depending on the eye gaze edge talker, um, here is uh, a SGD that's put out by LC Technologies. And uh, if you're in need of Medicare or uh, Medicaid support, here's the number for Kathy Fami. Right, and so be able to talk to her to get you the things that you and your loved one need. And so uh, initially for uh, to, to process these SGDs as durable medical equipment, you need a physician or a speech pathologist to prescribe or to indicate the need. And so, of course, uh, insurances may cover up to 80%, if not all of it. And so uh, to see what these different devices look like, in action, uh, we have here a video of someone who is using an SGD or a higher tech assistive technology or DME through, um, uh, through their insurance and being able to uh, integrate this technology into their lives. I can communicate with her. So let me sit in there for minutes trying to figure out exactly what she's trying to pronunciate but she can't, you know, it just made it easier on me. And now she can talk to me, so I know she's back alive again. And I love her. <laughs> Be like, oh. I like, uh oh. I'm a tough person, so I keep it moving. <laughs> yes, she does. And I'm just glad that she could communicate with me. I tell the family members, oh yeah, she can talk drunk to me now, so my baby is back, you know, cause no communication is very, you know, a very bad thing. Dilly dilly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, and so next, uh, last one that we talked about was the eye tribe tracker. And so here, uh, it's for um, a little bit the itribe.com, and here essentially it is uh, Medicare, Medicaid uh, com compatible as well. Um, and so uh, next we'll talk about uh, durable medical equipment. So not always do they need to be very high tech, not always do they need to be eye tracking, not always do they need to be speech generating. They can even be simple things that you can integrate into your lives today that can make you, or that can make you safer, right? And make it easier to access the things that you need to access. So um, uh, here are uh, Ask Your Medicare Provider about um, uh, different places you can go, so the medicare.gov, or you can call 1-800-MEDICARE, right, to find the nearest DME provider near you. And that's important because not all durable medical equipment shops accept Medicare. So you need to find one that does accept Medicare, and you can find one through uh, the website or giving them a call. 
And so, for example, in Orange County, um, we have here a, um, a Medicare accepting DME shop provider is um, Imperial, Imperial Emporium Healthcare uh, in Fullerton, right? And so in Orange County, that's sort of uh, one option. So, for example, uh, another example of what we'll talk about when we're talking about DMEs is um, there are durable medical equipment to assist with eating. So here is one, doesn't have to be high tech. Here it's essentially a bib that can catch crumbs, food, and things like that. That way it's, it's a little bit uh, cleaner to eat. If, uh, you know, um, sometimes hand movements becomes difficult to eat. This way um, the bib catches uh, food so that it is as confined as possible. Other ones could be things like utensil straps, right? So strapping on a spoon or fork or other utensils to the hand. Sometimes, you know, uh, you have um, difficulties with hand movements or even grip. Sometimes gripping is a problem for some individuals. Not all, but for, you know, like we we're saying, the whole theme of this essential talk is that there are a bunch of different technologies out there. And the, the best way to fit this is to fit which one of those fit your individualized need. Um, and then other DMEs for eating are the power of red. And so here we have different utensils, spoon, fork, knives that are, have red utensils, right? And so what is the power of red? And the power of red, especially in eating and appetite, it's been shown in research, in the Alzheimer's research, to be um, assisting in the stimulation of appetite, Right, so that uh, the individual eats more, right, so they can inc uh, they can have a greater appetite. That may be some issues for some individuals in, in the certain progression in their disease. So increasing your appetite is the power of red, and you can also think of just even without anyone with without any neurological condition, right? Uh, just the run uh, the typical person, right? Uh, we can think of. Uh, any one of our um, fast food restaurants, the McDonald's, the KFCs, the Wendy's, Burger King, all of those logos have red in them. And that's, you know, it's based off of research that the power of red stimulates appetite. So, um, yeah, and even cups. So all different kinds of utensils, cups, bowls, things like that. Um, there are also DMEs for safety, right? So, for example, getting in and out of the car. Right? This, can, this can not only be um, difficult, but it can also pose to be a very dangerous thing, especially if your caregiver is, let's say, smaller or uh, you know, smaller than, than the person trying to uh, come out of the vehicle. Um, it can be difficult sometimes. So at least a car handle can make it easier to get in and out of a vehicle. Likewise, there's also those handles, but for your bedside. So getting in and out of bed, right? And so this way it can make you safer and it can make things easier. Other ones for safety is, let's say, uh, your, for your loved one's further progression um, into the disease. And so they have difficulties getting in and out of bed or just moving about or getting in and out of the bathtub, right? So that may, may be posing a very dangerous thing to get them in shower and out and be done safely. So if, let's say, there's some individuals who have, let's say, a lot of hair, so like uh, women, for example, and, you know, sometimes uh, you just need to make sure that their head is washed, right? And so maybe keeping them in bed and giving, washing their head uh, using this DME where essentially it's a, an inflatable, um, waterproof, head rest that you can put in the bed, give them a head wash, and then clear out. Then there are also other handlebars, so like there's handlebars getting in and out of the car, getting handlebars to get in and out of bed, or handlebars to get on and off the um, ceramic throne or the toilet. So um, there are also DMEs to help you access, you and your loved one to access exercise. So that's another thing that will be coming, that comes up a lot is the benefit, but the psychological, the physical, the psychiatric, just all these tons and tons of great benefits that come along with exercise. 
and it's like, oh, you need to walk. But sometimes that's not always possible. What if it's raining outside? What if you can't walk? What if it's not necessarily safe? What if it's dark outside, right? So exercise in the traditional sense is not always one accessible or it's not always safe for people, for all people, right? And so in this case, it would be beneficial to be able to access exercise equipment that don't necessarily require a gym membership that you can take at home and so that don't necessarily require a person to be completely independent. And so one is, let's say here's a foot pedal. And so there's a foot pedal where you can just lay it out and, the end of it, and you or your loved one just get on and so they can uh, continue to move, get the blood flow through their legs through some pedaling. Or another one is the opposite. So one is for foot pedaling, the other one is for arm movement, right? So there's an exercise pulley, this that you'll see here in the photo, you just throw it over like a door hinge and then basically you use the weight of your own body to help you assist in your exercises. Um, there could be other DMEs for let's say movement, right? So we're talking about um, different um, scooters, right? Uh, and you may even look at that one, kind of looks like a bicycle. We'll see what that one talks about. Or um, here there are scooters, motorized scooters. Here this is, uh, um, it has, uh, can, I mean, some of them uh, boast speeds up to 30 miles per hour, right? And so you could keep up with vehicles in a residential zone with, uh, with this here um, scooter. And so the one on the left, right, this is almost like a bicycle. For here, this is found in research. It's called the walk bicycle. And so like the walk bicycle, it's based on the whole idea that um, it's primarily a Parkinsonian sort of symptom. It's called freezing of gait, where you're trying to walk and it's, it's difficult because um, for the most part, uh, moving forward becomes sort of a difficult thing to do. It's primarily a Parkinsonian symptom, but it is also a large part of Huntington's disease, as Huntington's disease has been described as a progressive degeneration of not just your physical abilities, but your cognitive abilities, as well as your psychiatric abilities or capacities. And so uh, freezing of gait found in research has been shown that maybe this might be this freezing of gait, this sort of uh, difficult moving forward off, um, uh, movement is difficult because of the concept of laterally shifting your weight. So shifting your weight from left to the right side, to the right side back to the left. And so um, shifting your weight that has been suggested, hypothesized to be cause, the cause of a lot of this freezing of gait phenomenon, right? And so bicycling avoids this having to laterally shift your weight. However, it's not always feasible, nor is it safe to mount and dismount, right? And so, uh, rightfully so, what's been done is called the walk bicycle, which is essentially, it's a bicycle, but there are no pedals, it's a lowered seat, and it has been shown to reduce freezing of gait in some. Um, moreover, if you're able to get to, let's say, a, um, a gym or you have an elliptical machine at home, uh, elliptical, or if you're able to get onto an elliptical machine, uh, it's been shown that elliptical machines you know, uh, reduces the high impact of, let's say, walking or running on the knees, so that way um, you can uh, protect your knees, and also it eliminates the need to have to laterally shift your weight on your own because the uh, machine does the weight shifting for you. Other things have been like smarter furniture, and so uh, these are things like um, hard plastic instead of glass, rising furniture, right, or chairs with assists. And so uh, here, these different chairs, maybe it's getting in and out of a chair could be difficult for you, or you or a loved one, right? And so there are chairs that have a spring, that are spring action, so it can rise to help you get out of the chair. And even though those can help you get out of a chair, let's say you need some additional assistance, so getting out of the chair, and then there are even some assists where this chair here has a handlebar on the left. So it can help you rise up and then help you stabilize the handle to get out of your chair, 
right, so that you can move about your home, your own home, your own space, freely and independently. But most importantly, you can do so safely. And so, um, like we can also talk about is physical therapy techniques. And so, um, I'm... Physical therapy techniques are important because of uh, how you can use things like chairs and tables as assistive technology to assist you in accessing exercises that may be helpful in not only improving your mood, your cognitive ability, but also strengthening your muscles so that the likelihood of you, your, your injury due to fall risk decreases. So there's a lot of different benefits that can come from exercise, right? And so sometimes it's not always safe or nor is it always accessible. And so ATEC, like we've seen before, ATEC can be used to help assist us in accessing exercises. And so physical therapy has uh, particular areas of rehabilitation. So primarily with gait and balance, strength, posture, right? So and postural stability, this is important for, let's say, eating. Eating, you should be sitting upright. You should have good posture, right? And so eating while with good posture decreases significantly the likelihood that you will choke or aspirate, right? And so other things that are postural stability are laterally shifting your weight, right? That's what we talked about with the, the walk bicycle. Um, there are benefits, there are tons of benefits to seeing a physical therapist. For one, it can help you strengthen your muscles, right, to prevent falls. It can promote the correct way to walk, right? And so we'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, so it can build your coordination, your flexibility, and can facilitate your confidence in your body movement. And so confidence, that is very important, right? So if you are confident that you are walking in the most appropriate way for you, right, you're having confidence. And literally when you see those, uh, when you have confidence, you have more, you can ensure that when you move, it is more safe and it is uh, done in a way that you are comfortable based off your individual um, bodily needs. And so any of the exercises that are in the uh, handout that, that will be posted, um, they can be adapted to uh, anyone of any level of any rate of progression. And it can be also adapted for lying down, sitting, or standing. And so physical therapists, how can they help individuals with Huntington's disease, right? So they can teach you how to maintain your energy based off of your movements. They help you with aerobic exercises, that's that cardiovascular to get your heart rate up. Strengthening exercises, and so uh, stretching exercises, right? And we'll see these stretching exercises are important to help avoid muscle tightness. And then strengthening and balance to prevent falls and assisting with DME. So we just had a tour of durable medical equipment. And so physical therapists can help you select which one of those very many DMEs, because there, there are tons and tons out there. Physical therapists can assess your physical needs and help you select of all of the different DMEs out there, which ones would be best fitted for you. And then not only can they select them, but they will teach you how to use them. And so another one, very important way for uh, that PTs can help individuals with Huntington's disease is it's not only just helping the individual themselves like that loved one with Huntington's disease, but they can also help the loved one caring for their loved one with Huntington's disease. It can help caregivers how to assist transferring um, a, uh, their, their affected from in and out of the car, in and out of the bed, in and out of the, um, the bathtub, and they can uh, teach these caregivers how to safely not only to safely do it for their loved one, but how to safely for them transfer without harming their back or without falling or anything like that. And so PTs can do a lot. And so other hacks for daily living, uh, these include, um, uh, like we we're talking about, engaging in exercises, routine, and safety. 
And uh, other ones for eating, these could be like sitting up, having good posture to avoid choking or anything like that. Um, and so uh, DMEs, they can help with chewing or drinking. Make sure to not drink too much water at any one time. Or the clock technique, right? This has been helpful for individuals who have, let's say, cognitive deficit, who have difficulties identifying what is what. Um, and so the clock technique is basically a plate, right? And so if, especially if your loved one who is affected with the disease has difficulties with their vision, right? So vision, um, you can take a plate, picture a plate as a clock and at six o'clock you have your proteins will always be at your six o'clock right or your vegetables will always be at your 12 o'clock right or the dessert or the sweet or the sauce the sauces with the barbecue sauce ranch or anything like that that will always be at your three o'clock that way um, you get into routine and so by uh, having a routine you um, decrease the 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 likelihood of error and then sleep having good sleep hygiene so that's low to no light uh, no loud abrupt sounds so for individuals who like to sleep with the tv on right just keep the volume low for good sleep hygiene um, and then there are uh, the some cognitive strategies also that we'll talk about and so uh, the cognitive changes in hd um, you're all familiar with that, preaching to the choir there. So memory, learning, perception, executive functions, language and communication in others. And so uh, keeping your life organized uh, is to minimize the clutter, right? So if there are multiple different things on your desk, keep one thing at a time, right? And so these are uh, maintaining your cognitive and physical benefits. Um, and so also determining the order of activities for the day. So having a schedule, having a routine. And so the routine is important for all the ways that we've just discussed a couple of minutes ago. Uh, and so sorting and prioritizing and uh, maintaining cognitive clarity. Maintaining cognitive clarity is, can be done in a couple of different ways. And so keeping the clarity is uh, done in these different ways. Right? And so removing distractions, and this is important, especially for uh, assisting your uh, loved one in eating. Right? So um, eating uh, for, you know, in HD uh, is not a time really for catching up on how your daily activities, that sort of thing. Because um, having them speak at the same time while also trying to concentrate on eating, those are multiple different things going on at the same time. And so that could increase the risk of choking or aspiration. Right? So doing one thing at a time is allowing uh, your clarity, cognitive clarity. And so how can we remember tasks? And so uh, remembering tasks can come from a number of different ways. And so these are just very low to no tech alternatives that you can use to help you remember things. And so using a calendar, right, or a day planner, right, and um, uh, using a regular routine or a schedule, right, that can also be a way to help remember things. Having to-do lists or reminder watches. And so having something on your wrist that beeps or vibrates when it's time to do something, right? Smartphone apps. I'm not sure why everything is moving in uh, different orders, but right, so here, just follow along here. And so next is Tile. And so Tile is a locating software so that you can use. A tile is, you go onto the tileapp.com and basically it's a keychain size tile that you can put, it's adhesive, you can place it as a keychain on your keys or on your cell phone or on a person to always track where, this, where these objects are. And you can track them using the, this website, the Tile app here. And then having a single place in your home where everything are kept at all times. And so the whole idea here is to reduce the cognitive load of having to remember where I placed my cell phone, where did I place my keys, where did I place my calendar, right? So if you're always placing them in the same place every time and have that routine, that reduces the cognitive load so that you can use your mental resources for other activities. So, uh, for example, right, so I mean, think of just anyone here, if you carry your cell phone with you, I'm willing to bet 
that you always keep it in the same pocket. You don't, mine's, I always keep mine in my left pocket. I don't always, there are some days I keep it in my right pocket, some days I keep it in my left pocket, some days I keep it in my back pocket. All right, I always keep it in my left. And so that way I'm in a routine. So I don't always have to remember where I put my phone. Um, another one could be uh, the Find My Friends app, right? And so this is essentially, it turns your phone into uh, a tracking device. And, and no, not to, to, to impose on any uh, privacy issues here, but if let's say you're going somewhere that's crowded with a loved one. And so sometimes, you know, uh, I, I don't mean to get lost, but I mean, if I get lost, I, I, the loved one may or may not know how to find their way. Right, and so this way you can always have um, just a, a finger on them, so you can be comfortable going out in public with your loved one, and keeping them safe is most important. Um, Cognive app, uh, so Best Suites. Here's another Cognive app. Uh, check this out at um, thebestconnections.org, um, and then uh, there are task lists. And so these are things that can be used to supplement your memory, right? So I need to get done items one, two, three, and four, right? And so these are things that can be used to supplement your memory. Uh, if a reminder watch sounds good to you, then here are some different things, that uh, some different companies and websites where you can access a reminder watch. And so here, these are all different agencies or companies that produce reminder watches with individuals with cognitive deficits in mind, right? And so uh, you can access these. Vibrolite Wobble Time Timer. Or let's say if you're trying to find other apps to slow the cognitive decline. There are uh, applications that, like fun games that you can play at home. They're fun, they're games, but they actually keep you cognitively sharp as possible. And so one is Lumosity, you might have heard of that, it costs money now. Um, but now uh, uh, one that is still free is NeuroNation. And NeuroNation is essentially a, um, an app that you could use to track your cognitive ability. So at the absolute least, if it's not to improve your memory, you can at the very least track where your cognitive abilities are. So that if it's declining, that's something, that another additional piece of information that you can bring to your neurologist or your physician. And um, yeah, so Neuro... Neuro Nation. Fitness for your brain. Improve your memory. Increase your concentration and keep yourself mentally fit. 10 minutes of training a day is all you need. In close alliance with leading neuroscientists, NeuroNation developed a state-of-the-art training program with more than 60 exercises that are both fun and effective. You decide which mental skills you want to train. Your memory, your concentration, your logical thinking and intelligence. Track your progress over time. Compare your results with friends and others and keep your brain in shape. NeuroNation. Download the free app now. Right, so um, it's based off the world's leading neuroscience. And so like we were saying, it can track your progress, right? So it can track your improvements. And even if that's not something that you're looking to do is to just improve your mind, I, I'm, you know, but if that's some, not something that's really something you believe in is improving your particular skills, it can show progression if let's say it's, it's degradating. And so that is another piece of information you can bring to uh, your, your neurologist. And so they can best track and treat so it gives them another piece of information to triangulate what's going on for you. And so um, well, uh, as the final frontiers we're talking about is there has been large leaps and bounds in neuroscience in the past 10 to 15 years. And so one of the uh, related fields that has burged over the past couple of years is the field of affective neuroscience. And it's the idea that how there are neural mechanisms behind the way that we feel. There are neural mechanisms behind our emotions. And so there are positive or happy, and there are negative or sad areas in the brain 
And so there are different neuroplasticity, which is the whole idea that our brain is malleable, that we can change the way our brain functions by how the things that we do. And all we have to do is pretty much just as in exercises, we have to um, uh, train the brain and we can uh, exercise the brain to think and feel certain ways that we, before we used to think we're static, but actually the brain is malleable and we can train it to do certain things. And we can train it to be more effective, we can train it to be more efficient. And the biggest takeaway is that of all the different kinds of things that we can see with affective neuroscience is the biggest takeaway point, at least for us, is as we incorporate uh, strategies, as we incorporate and integrate assistive technologies, both low-tech, high-tech, free A-tech, expensive A-tech, low to minimal cost, right, um, DMEs, strategies keeping cognitive clarity, once we can start integrating all of these different ATEX strategies, all of these different things into our lives, we can actually train our brains to not only be more efficient, not only to train our brains to be more effective, but we can literally train our brains to be happy. And so with that said, uh, thank you very much for your time spending the, uh, this afternoon with me. Uh, if there are any questions at all, please direct them to the website. And I, um, my name is Daniel Ignacio. I'm from the HDSA Orange County chapter and it has been my uh, pleasure and honor to be speaking to you today. Have a great day.